Hey everybody, John Grimsmore here bringing you an at-home vlog. Best of intentions, I did wake up super early this morning and pulled up my computer over breakfast and I just started cranking on Fusion. Just started making stuff. Just started making tool paths and importing tools and designing tools and everything I need to do to make this Rask blade that I'm working on at this time. Finish the fixture, deck all the sides, do all the stuff I need to do there. Um, and that that morning over breakfast turned into well it's lunchtime turned into well it's the early afternoon i can still go in for a couple hours <laughs> turned into well it's it's saturday and tomorrow's mother's day so maybe i should you know keep hanging out here and it, it's been awesome hanging out with the kids but actually focused on work today i was on my computer almost the entire day which was super productive um let me show you real quick what i've been working on and then uh claire and i want to talk about this so guys, I don't talk about 3D printing that much, but it's huge. We, we, we have the printer at home right now in our basement and uh, I use it all the time. And uh, I wanna get a bigger, little bit fancier one for work, maybe a Prusa. I'm gonna get this blog that we've been making. But I mean, this thing was super cheap. $200. Yeah, 220 bucks on Amazon. It's the uh, Monoprice Mini S2. Except we do need a bigger one. Yeah, it's got a four inch by four inch work zone, so it's fairly limited. Something eight to 10 inches would be epic. Um, but I was just talking with a guy on Instagram last night that he's like, oh, I wanna get into designing, I love it. And I'm like, buy a 3D printer. Put it in your tiny little apartment and you'll be able to design something and print it and feel it in your hand. And you wanna see what that knife handle feels like? You just print it and you, you feel it. You, you have this tactical, you can print pliers and have the ergonomics and you can actually make them move and joints and stuff. So at home here, Claire and I are fixing the 3D printer. Yeah. And we had our, the rest of my mask. our Bowden tube. Um, Why isn't it working though? That fitting has to be replaced. Actually, it's this one because I swapped them. But, but... The Bowden tube got stuck in there and like glued in. Hi, viewers. I don't know. So we got some new ones. We're gonna put them in. So I can I measure this and cut it? Yeah, cut it a little bit longer than the last one. Yeah. Okay. So this is our uh, Mono Price Mini. It was like two hundred and twenty bucks on Amazon. Uh, on Super that? awesome. Yeah. Cheap, not the best, but we've printed so much stuff with it, right? Yeah, we're printing my mask. We're printing. Claire just figured out how this fitting works. Yeah, so I don't know if you can see, but it's kind of hard to see, but you can see those little little silver things in there? Yep. When you push it down, they just, they go back into the structure, so that's how it can go in and out. It's the little silver things, they grab on. I'm smart! Sweet. Okay, now we've got to unscrew these and replace them both. Okay, so we found this really cool idea, so we took, since it was hard to, like, like, told this, we took a pair of pliers, and we put it in, and now it's much easier to screw in. Look at that. It's still nice hard. Trick. Still hard, but we'll figure it out. And Claire learned that the nut is the same on both sides. Doesn't matter which way it goes on. That's weird, because I The threads go all the way through. Same on both sides. Sometimes they have a little nylon, like, lock nut inside one side. Heard of a paper washer? What's a paper washer? It's a little thing to if there's space between. If there's space between it. Um, it's even yours. It makes it so that it's easier. It's like so it's nice. It's in. Oh yeah. Okay, so now we gotta take the tube. This is the. New one. So we gotta make it tight first. This tight. It's gotta be real tight. See, not tight. It's okay, we'll use the pliers, we'll get it tight. Put this in. All right, what are we doing now, Clara? Okay, we need to get this piece, this little piece of filament out. Filament, basically the, pla the thin plastic that the 3D printer melts. Um, so we want to this to monitor. Yep. I'm gonna put it to monitor. And this one. Remember? Which one? Uh, plus. Start preheat. Start preheat. 
So in about a minute or two, that's going to heat up the extruder, and then this guy will pull right out. This is going to take forever just trying to get to 190. This piece. So I'm going to think it's almost getting hot enough. 159. Oh, I can feel the warmth a little bit. 170. you got to let it, like, equalize. Okay, so it started it. It's really small. I don't know if you guys can see it, but okay. It was not 190, and it's 193, 196, 97. I don't know if that's very good. Okay, now you can see it's pulling out. Maybe there's a glob stuck in there. I'm gonna try. Can I, can I try and use the pliers? Sure. It's like, shh, eh, okay. We found out that there's probably a big glob in there, so instead of trying to pull it out, we're just going to try and let it kind of just melt out. Like, pull on it again and maybe try and push it a little bit more. Okay. Ah, uh, you see? See, there it goes. Right Look at there? that booger. Yeah, that's where it was stuck. So one of the neatest things about 3D printing is it's literally a CNC machine. <laughs> It's got stepper motors, it's got a computer, like a, a brain that, that activates the stepper motors, it's got a control module, like, it acts very similar to a big three-axis milling machine, except it just heats up and melts plastic and lays it down in the perfect form. Um, it's not always perfect. No, it's not always perfect. Claire is bedazz <laughs> bedazzling. No, those are her That's his unibrow. That's his mouth. Wait, Don't give it a that's, unibrow. That's his nose. And that's his mouth. <laughs> all right, should we do the first print? Yeah. Okay, we're all heated up. Go ahead. Okay. Slide it back in. So this printer is like super basic. It's only got a couple, got a couple screens. And should be only a few files on there. Uh, yeah. I can't remember if we're doing right jaw or left jaw. I think we already did right jaw. All right. First layer adhesion is one of the most important things. <laughs> I, I wanted to, I, I, like, I just oh, the... Oh, oh, that did not work. Oh, oh, <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the right Allen key at home. All my tools are at work. I need this tiny little, Ooh. I need this tiny little like one millimeter or two millimeter Allen key that I don't have here. So, well, that's my problem, huh? Yeah. So you can see, obviously, it's not working. Well, that concludes the 3D printer segment for today. Until I go to work and bring some tools home. <laughs> it's funny because when we did work out of the garage at our old house, old old house, um, all the tools were right in the garage. Everything we had was right there. Now my shop is. 12 minutes away and I have almost nothing at home. I have a little little tiny toolbox with like a hammer and pliers and stuff. I'm not a very good home mechanic. So currently this is some of the stuff we're printing. This is going to be a uh, T-Rex skull that I had to scale down to 70% because even the model online wouldn't fit on the printer unless I scaled it to 70% and I actually had to figure out how to split the model and, and print little pins because some of the pieces were still too big but um, hopefully this will be big enough to go over Clara's head and we'll glue it all together and she'll be able to like have a T-Rex skull on her head which is kind of the goal right now. So I don't have a lot of 3D printed objects at home uh, except for my favorite one which is down here. So in my shower, I 3D printed these. It says shampoo, it says conditioner. They're at an angle. So as I'm showering, boom. Even 3D, you know, designed uh, kind of a drain. And there should be a hole. Yeah, there's a hole at the bottom. And a little soap rack. And it clips right into the bar. And funny enough, the bar is at like a 10 degree angle or something. So I had to print these at an angle in order to fit. And then I used a hose clamp there to cinch them this way and against the wall. 
otherwise they they clip right on but i mean these are an, a daily joy for me right now so i think 3d printing i don't know if it gets a bad rap but it's certainly misunderstood because so much of it is just trinkets or toys or you get one and you print things from thingiverse and it's like a little you know car that rolls or whatever and it's not that important however as we're seeing now with the whole you know virus thing and people printing face shields it is actually useful if you're smart enough to apply it um the coolest thing though is like i was saying before being able to design something being able to just print it and feel it and hold it and scale it and see it <laughs> It's absolutely the easiest way to manufacture something, by far. So, highly recommended. All right, so, Rask Blade is the goal right now. Sound check. So, I've got a blade. How do I simplify this so I can explain it well? Thinking, thinking, thinking. Well, I've got a couple files here. Not that one. I've got this one, TS Tombstone Design Rask. This is kind of my dump where where the design is going to go. The, the main, like, all of it. All the parts, all the components, and everything. And then I have another file here called Rask Cam that the design is imported. That's this one right here. And a couple of the components are imported, but it's simpler. There's less garbage, there's less sketches, there's less busyness. So that this one pretty much only has cam and cam sketches. And then this one has all the multiple sketches and multiple components and all the extra stuff that you need to design other stuff um, can be in this file. And then in this file as well is where I have the cam in order to make itself, to, to make the tombstone. So something I worked on was the facing operation, which a couple of videos ago we faced the top face and it looked amazing. Next step will be to come in here in a couple light passes, face that, and then do a circular pattern so that it hits all four sides. And then we're gonna come in and we're gonna radius these sides with the tool at kind of a 45 degree angle like that. And uh, the same up here, and then we're gonna circular pattern that. So I know they're not generated, but I'm gonna simulate anyway. So face mill like that, all four sides, I'll get rid of the tool path. And then here's what the, um, that tool's gonna to do. Pretty simple. And it's just gonna go through. I don't really care how long it takes. Looks like only a minute or two per, per, per section. Should be beautiful when it's done. I just noticed I ran out of storage space on my phone internal drive, so I lost a couple minutes there. Anyway, round two. Sync again. Okay. Okay, so next, moving into CAM, uh, into the RAS CAM file. So we have the blade here. I've been working on all these toolpath operations. Um, I'm not gonna generate them right now because they're good for, for what we're doing. So I've got just the flute showing, not the entire tool holder, so we can see what's going on. I've got the model hidden, which is a super handy feature the little light bulb or eyeball, whatever you call it. And then let's go through. So I'm gonna spot three holes, I'm gonna spot that, drill the detent, drill the jimping, interpolate with an end mill, the detent, um, this detent hole, there's some fancy little geometry in here that makes it full Grimsmo. So I'm drilling out the three clearance holes, I'm plunging it with an eighth inch ball mill, and I'm clearancing it out. This is how we do it on the Norseman, it works awesome. Opening up the hole, coming in with a different tool, and I'm finishing the arc slot, slot. And then I'm trying something new here. I'm doing a bore operation, spiraling around at final diameter, so that theoretically, the tip of the tool does all the work, and the sides of the tool kind of become a wiper, and just continually wipe down the surface. I've never done this before. Normally, on the Norseman, we plunge it in, 
and we interpolate out once or twice or whatever and then uh, call that good. But any little chips in the end mill will um, leave a bad finish. And then on the Mori and on the Norseman, we have this little magical tool, a Cogsdill roller burnishing tool. Check this out. So it's a roller burnisher that's super adjustable, and it, uh, it, it, it squishes the material, and it makes it just really nice. So it takes a this waveform finish that every machine surface is going to have, and it just squishes it down and polishes and makes it beautiful. We get a much more accurate hole size and an insane finish, and actually the material is kind of ever so slightly swelled out and makes a theoretically harder surface. Um, and that's how we like doing it, except the problem with this tool is it is way too long to fit in the kern. Like, it just, it just ain't gonna fit. So I talked to them, see if they can make a shorter one, um, waiting to hear back. But this method might give me the finish that I want and the accuracy that I want for now. So we'll go with that for now. And then let's see. So I've got a chamfer. I'm using a thread mill, actually. Chamfer the top. Chamfer the bottom. We look down here, make sure it does. Yes, it does. Good. Okay, that plunge is wrong. Okay, I haven't fully verified that this works yet. Okay, and then we've got our double chamfer tool. This is about as far as I got so far. Um, the profile, I still have to finalize the look at, make sure it does what it's supposed to do. I saw it plunged here kind of grossly. Like right there, you can't have that. Because it plunges quickly and you don't want it to do that. So I gotta add a little lead in, make that do better. And then notice how the jimping holes, I drill them first and then Profile them out, and then later I'm going to come in with an end mill and I'm going to plunge them. It gets a little bit better finish than the drill bit does. Come around, lift up around this tab because I need the strength here until the very, very, very end. So this is the roughing operation. And then I'm going to come in with a similar tool and I'm going to do a finishing operation. And then the um, double corner rounder comes in. I got to change this section here because uh, that's too much chamfer, but I do want a little bit of chamfer corner around there. So I want to move that, that section out based on the, uh, that little sketch geometry right there. So I can just tilt that outwards a little bit. But yeah, so I have not only that, but I have all the features I need to make the fixture. And uh, I'm getting there. I also have a second blade down here, you'll notice, that uh, there's going to be a tab left on the front here um, during and after heat treat. That has to be cut off. The edge, the entire edge portion, is going to have a little bit of meat left over after grinding. Um, so that has to be cut off, and then we'll probably do the hard engraving, the serial number and the name and all that stuff um, in, this, in this clamping as well. So we're going to have two blades set up here. So that's where I'm at. I mean, I still have quite a bit of work to do. Got to mount handles here, um, hard blades here for grinding, which is going to be super fun to do. And then we got to build a center pallet, which is well, that little guy. So that was a quick little five minute sneak peek into my cam life workflow. Um, I don't know, I'm not used to doing screen grabs. I feel like I'm running. I don't want it to get boring. <laughs> but I know I like I've watched hour long screen grabs before. And uh, I just have to remind myself that it's, it's not necessarily what I'm saying. It's what I'm doing. And it, that you guys pick up on, especially you guys actually using fusion. Um, and the more you do on film, the more those little nuggets get shared. So I got to remember that. So it's exciting, inching my way closer and closer to Rask, having a blade, getting it through heat treat, putting it back on the machine, hard milling the bevels, uh, putting in the die cut, die cut grinding wheels um, to try to get that 
amazing, amazing finish that I know we can get. Um, it's going to be a fun process. I think I'm at the point now where we'll actually start to see some traction. I'm getting faster with the current. I'm getting a little bit faster with programming. It's still super time consuming, um, but I have a lot more confidence with the machine and stuff. So I want to see faster progress and I'm probably, my time at the shop is probably going to have to be more focused on one thing like today's a current day or today's a Swiss day instead of always trying to do both. I mean, it's super nice to have the Swiss running in the background, but when it takes an hour or two or three or the day to get it dialed, um, it distracts me from the current and I have to do both, but not at the same time. Um, so yeah, I just got to plan a little bit better, but the more time I spend designing stuff for the current, the more parts I want to make on the current. Um, I'm, I've got crazy fixturing ideas. I want to put some, some of the pen parts on there to either free up the other, one of the other two lathes or, um, just do some features that the lathes can't do. I mean, I've got a 42,000 RPM spindle here. Let's do, let's do some intricate engravings on the pens. Um, so I've got a sweet fixture design in my head for, to actually hold on, I'll tell you right now. <clears throat> Something I've always wanted to do is add a texture to the tube. Um, I love it. It's sleek, it's smooth, but it's a little slippery. And not everybody loves the little Viking heads in the front. Um, I like them. I think it's awesome. But some people like it smooth, whatever. I want to put a full pattern, whether it's honeycomb or a spiral or whatever, fingerprints, I don't care, um, over the whole tube. So I've got this idea. Wow, that tip is on there tight. There you go. I've got this idea to make um, the little three inch pallets that I have on the on the back side of the Aroa, not the six inches, but the three inches. I want to make like an integrated base that's that bolts to the fixture and then tapers down to a tube that comes up and then has a little threaded hole at the top so that this can slip onto there and then the little threaded hole will have a screw and this has 60 degree tapers on both sides so at the bottom of the the tube thing there'll be a little 60 degree and then at the top there'll be a little clampy nut with a 60 degree taper that's going to screw down and then clamp it so that theoretically if i'm do, doing it right it'll be pinched from a degree point on both sides it should be fairly well centered um, ideally perfectly well centered and then, and then I'll have access to it like this, and I can five axis and tilt it and and rotate and like do all kinds of awesome stuff. So I can do some of the spiral engraving on the lathe, um, especially if you hold it between like centers, between dead centers or whatever. But uh, the current's going to do it so much better and so much faster. And it has spindle time. Like I'm looking for that for those jobs that. Imagine if I had 10 of these, 10 of those on pallets, and it was the job that runs when nothing else is running. And it's scheduled and and just, what am I trying to say? If there's downtime, that runs. And if the fixtures are not loaded, load them. And then if there's downtime, it runs. Like the more jobs like that we can have, especially for our own products, it's gonna be epic. So I'm starting to wrap my head around that kind of workflow, that mindset. Um, yeah, exciting stuff. All right, guys, that concludes this video. Um, tomorrow is Mother's Day, so I'm not going in on Mother's Day. I think I'm off on Monday as well. But then sounds like Tuesday. I think I'm in on Tuesday. Um, tell you what, by Tuesday, I'm going to be ready to rock. I'm going to have code ready to go. I'm going to have a list of tools that need to be set up. Uh, I'm gonna be ready to go. I'm gonna use the time here at home to make sure that I'm ordering the stuff that I keep forgetting to order, like material for clamps that I keep forgetting. Um, some end mills, some custom end mills, some bulk end mills, um, 3D printer filament, and all kinds of stuff. So, hope you guys enjoyed this slightly different format video, <laughs> but it's been fun. All right, later, bye.